So first of all, you know, just a quick reminder that we do have a homework assignment due on Wednesday. So I hope you guys are at least in progress, if not already done with it. You don't have to do a whole lot of simplification as long well as you know, the result is a CNF and it is equivalent to the original you know, statement or condition, you'll be fine. So I'm not looking for optimal answers. You also do not need to go for the quickest and you know, most optimal derivation. So the whole point is you know, we, you know, just kind of let you guys you know, figure out how to work with uh, Boolean algebra. As long as you get to the destination, taking the scenic route is okay. <laughs> All right, so do we have any questions about you know, the homework assignment that is due on Wednesday? All right, seeing none, I am going to proceed with uh, the formal introduction of counting. All right, so it sounds really exciting, right, <coughs> in counting. Well, as it turns out, you know, the problem that we looked at the other day, you know, uh, the log of problem, that is counting, okay? We are simply counting the number of possible tickets. If you want to win the jackpot, there's only one ticket out of all the possible uh, tickets to win the jackpot. So we are trying to figure out the chances of doing something, or of you know, matching something. So we're gonna formally introduce you know, you know, counting as a topic today. Um, you know, there are some terms that are important, so we'll, we, let's go ahead and start with this uh, discussion. Right. So this one I have not yet converted into GitHub, so you know it's you know you just kind of have to. I'll do it maybe later. Okay. So you know, this is not in GitHub yet. All right. So we're going to start with a few terms. Okay. We'll start with the first term is a trial. So the way you think about the trial is a single event that has possible multi, that has several possible outcomes, but only one is going to be the actual outcome you know, out of the experiment. A very simple example is flipping a coin, okay? So when you flip a coin, it is a trial, okay? Every time you flip a coin, it is one trial. But a trial has two possible outcomes because it can be head or tail. You can also think about throwing a dice. So when you throw a dice, each time you throw a dice, it's one single trial or one single event, but in the case of a regular dice that has six faces, then you have six possible outcomes out of that one single trial. So do we have any questions about you know, what the term trial is referring to? Nope, okay, all right. So the next um, sentence or the next paragraph talks about you know, how a single trial can have multiple possible outcomes, but only one of the possible outcomes is going to be the actual outcome out of you know, a particular trial, okay? So we are not talking about quantum mechanics here. So this is, I mean, when we say there's only one single outcome, it means it ha only has one single outcome. All right, so do we have any questions about the term outcome and how it relates to the term of trial? So if flipping a coin is a trial, then it has two possible outcomes, being heads or tail. If throwing a dice is one trial, then it has six possible outcomes because most dice that we use, except for you know, rare occasions, has six faces. So now we talk about an experiment. So an experiment is a series of trials where subsequent trials may be affected by earlier ones. So, in this one, you know, the best way to imagine what an experiment is, is to think about you have a bag, okay? Like a bag, and you put, you know, six, you know, no, no, uh, six, uh, six cards in it, okay? Each one has a number on it. So you just number these as one, two, three, four, five, six. You put all in the bag, and then you shake it up, okay? So and if a trial in this case can be Take one of that. Uh, take one paper out of the bag. Take one card out out of the bag. Okay, that's one trial. So the first trial, where all six pieces of paper are still in the bag, then you have six possible outcomes. Okay, but let's just say that you know, whatever you take out the out of the bag, you do not put it back into the bag for the next trial. So the next trial or the second trial now only has five pieces of paper in the bag, 
So as a result, there are only five possible outcomes in the second trial. And then the third trial only has, did I do the math wrong? Six times three, no, I got the math, math right. So the third trial will only have four pieces of paper left. So that means you only have possible four possible outcomes in the third trial. Is that okay? So that's why you know when we talk about an experiment, it is a series of trials, which means you know the sequencing may be important. Okay, there are some cases where the sequencing is not important, but unless you're otherwise told you know, to be so, then it is safer to look at an experiment as a series as a, as opposed to a set of trials. So generally, the outcome set of an experiment is represented by omega which is not to be confused with the set of operators or connectives in propositional calculus. In other words, we kind of recycle you know, Greek letters and you know, uh, letters from the English alphabet from time to time. Are we doing okay so far with these terms? Okay, so let me just identify those four terms. Yes, go ahead. Right. So from the context, you, know, you probably would know which one, unless I make some really kind of obscure exam question, you know, kind of mixing and matching propositional calculus and counting. So I have yet to uh, find a way to combine those two. Omega will appear one more time when we talk about um, the time complexity of algorithms. So we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll use omega again. So I guess you know, people just like you know, the Greek letter omega for some strange reason. If you like to watch you know, comic books, you know, Marvel also has you know, use for the omega. Some of you are nodding and knowing what I'm referencing, and other people are like, I have no idea because I don't read comic books. OK. So in general, the outcome of an experiment is represented by omega, which means it is a set which is not to be confused you know, with the set of operators in propositional calculus. So let me first identify those four terms that we need to understand. A trial, outcomes of a trial, an experiment as a series of trials, and then finally, the outcome of an experiment or the outcome set of an experiment, which is represented by omega. Are we good so far? All right. So the first thing we, we're going to take a look at is, hmm, well, maybe not yet. Okay, so I'm going to proceed a little bit forward before we you know, kind of go back and talk about um, some examples. All right, general counting. Generally speaking, we are counting the number of outcomes of an experiment. In other words, most of the time, we are not exactly interested in the actual outcome of an experiment. We are only interested in the number of items or the cardinality of the set omega. Okay, just like you know, in the case of the calculating the chances of winning the jackpot of Powerball Lotto, we are not really exactly interested in you know, who is winning or what number or which ticket is you know, winning the jackpot. You know, we are only interested in what are the chances. So that's why we are only usually interested in um, counting the outcomes but we're not so concerned about the actual outcomes in the set. It is not always the case, okay? You know, because in some cases, we also want to know the actual outcomes because in the case of um, playing a certain game, you know, when you have to rule out your possible outcomes, then we also want to know what the actual outcomes are. So we, I'm not gonna spend too much time to talk about um, a board game called I cannot remember. Mastermind, that's it. So Mastermind is a board game where you need to keep track of your know, outcomes that are still possible by you know making some guesses and based on the feedback of your guesses, you can rule out you know certain outcomes. So in those cases, we actually have to track your know, outcomes you know, that are still possible. But we are not we are not talking about that, so we will just kind of continue with this. So let T subscript I represent the outcome set of trial I. Okay, so this part is important. If I'm flipping a coin, okay, it doesn't matter which trial we are talking about, 
the set will still be containing head and tail. Each set will be head and tail. If I'm throwing the dice multiple times, okay, same thing. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which trial we are talking about. Every trial still has the numbers from one to six. However, if we are talking about taking an item out of a bag, then it kind of matters, okay? Because the first trial will have all six items in the bag. The second trial will only have five of the six items in the bag because the first item was taken out of the bag from the first trial, never put back into the bag. So the second trial will only have five out of the six original items. Does that make sense? So how, so whether t of zero and t of one are the same or how they relate kind of depends on whether you're putting back an item that you took out of something. Now, there are certain cases where you, when you flip a coin, you know, you always have two choices because, you know, just because the first time you flip a coin it landed on the head does not mean that it cannot land on the head again. Does that make sense? Okay. So it depends on what kind of experiment we are running. You know, the T of zero and T of one may be exactly the same. Or T of one may have one fewer element compared to T of zero. So is that concept okay? Yes, go ahead. Say that one more time, please. What does it mean when it is saying that I is zero oriented? Zero oriented simply means that the first trial is called trial zero instead of trial one. <clears throat> so that's just for counting purposes, you know, you know, to identify which one, which trial is the first trial in an experiment, you know. I could have randomly chose choose a number, you know, but you know, it's usually between zero and one. And you know, once you have learned C plus plus programming, you know, we kind of have a mindset of using zero as the first number in the sequence. All right. So in this case, um, when you look at the overall omega, it becomes your know, t of zero times your know, Cartesian product with t of one, Cartesian product with t of two, and so on. So now would be a good time for an example. So let me switch to Joplin. And Joplin is under octus. There we go. Yeah. Yep, go ahead. Oh, you want to go back to, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So uh, which paragraph, which paragraph are we looking at? Uh-huh. Because the, you're looking at the entire experiment. The experiment may have more than two trials. So you have to look at all the possible trials. I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, just give me a second to set up uh, Joplin and then we'll, we'll take a look at an example. So, get to Two. All right. So we are. Let's let's think about flipping a coin. Okay. So in the case of flipping a coin, and we'll just say that we are flipping a coin three times. Okay. <clears throat> so can someone tell me if if the experiment is flipping a coin th three times, what is what does a single trial look like? Just flipping a coin once. Okay. And what 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 are the outcomes of each trial? That's okay. Okay, very good. Okay, so in this case, if I were to use you know, the original uh, notation, the notation that is in the notes, so that means t zero and t one 
and T2 are all the same because they are all basically either head or tail. Is that okay? I'm just using H here to represent head and T to represent tail. Is that okay? So when you look at the entire outcome of the experiment, which is flipping a coin three times, so let's take a look what, at what omega may look like in this case. So omega is going to be the Cartesian product of T0, T1, T2, but they're all the same. So that means you know, the first one may be, um, I'm not writing the, the comma down, okay? You know, so H, H, H means H comma, H comma, H. In fact, I'm just gonna let go of the parentheses too. So this is one of the rare occasions where I'm not following this, the actual syntax because you know, otherwise it's a lot of stuff to type, okay? Uh, HXT, H T H T uh, H T T T H H T H T T T H and then finally T T T. So what went through my mind is to look at H as zero and T as zero, a T as one. So what I'm really doing is I'm listing um, the binary numbers from zero 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 to one 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 here. Yes. So omega is the set of possible outcomes for the entire experiment. So having the first, okay, I'll just randomly pick one. So it is possible, you know, out of the entire experiment that I have a head from the first trial or trial zero, a tail for trial one, and also again, a tail for trial two. So that means HTT is a possible outcome for the entire experiment. Does that, is that working okay? All right, cool. Any other questions about how I came up with this particular omega, which is the outcome set for the entire experiment? So we're okay with this? Okay, all right. So let's think about another example, okay? So in this case, we are taking a uh, marble out of a bag, and you know, I'm just gonna say originally, we have three marbles, RGB, okay? Your red, green, and blue. Okay, so we'll say your T of zero is RGB. So this one is a little bit more difficult to think about because um, what T1, what T, what T1 looks like kind of depends on which item did I choose in the first trial. And what T looks like really kind of depends on what T zero and T one, you know, is choosing out of the, choosing out of the uh, the bag. So, but I can still tell you what omega is going to look like. Okay, so in this case, <clears throat> omega is going to look like this. Once again, you know, this is a special occasion, so I'm not including the parentheses or the commas; they're kind of implied. So I can, I can have RGB, I can have RBG, I can have GRB, GBR, uh, G, G, T, R, and then I can have uh, PRG, and then BGR. Does that make sense to you? Yep. So what I have to explain is, so if that's a set out on the right, you have a bag of three, the three marbles, and you're taking one out, you only have E, G, R, B, or G, or R, B, right? Because you're taking one out of the, out of the bag. So mm -hmm. essentially, you only see two, two. So you don't get, if you put in the outcome, then you still have the three in the bag. So, no, this is about, you know, okay, I'll, I'll pick one example, okay? So I'll pick uh, this one here. What this is representing is I'm choosing blue, in T0, the first trial you know, takes out the blue one, the second trial takes out the red one, and then the third trial does not have a choice because only the green one is, le is left in the bag. Is that okay? So you're retaining it based on how you take it out, I believe? Say again one more time? You're button? retaining it based on what you take out. Yes. Okay. So the way I came up with this omega, so we'll take a look at how this omega comes about, okay? 
So that means, you know, so I'm using bulleted points this time. So using bulleted points um, for t0, okay, so for t0, this is trial zero. Trial zero is always going to be all three you know, marbles in the bag because we have not removed anything yet. So this is always R, D, and D. Is that okay? But depending on what we choose out of trial zero, we can say, you know, um, R is taken. We can also use, you know, G, oops, G and D. Is that okay? So these are the three outcomes for the first trial because we still have all three marbles in the bag. But when you look, look at this case, if the red marble is taken out of the bag first, okay, then T1 is going to be a little bit more restricted because you know, we are not putting the red marble back in the bag. So in this case, only the green and the blue marble are left in the bag. Is that okay? So this is what I was talking about a little bit earlier, where you know the um, subsequent trials may be impacted by the earlier trial when it comes to you know what are the possibilities. Okay. So now you know I can also do the same thing with this one, because the green one is taken out, so that means the red one and the blue ones are left in the bag. And then over here, because the blue one is taken out of the bag, so the green and the red ones are still left in there. Is that okay so far? All right. So I can repeat this, you know, you know, kind of in a very tedious way, because out of this, okay, two things can happen. Because I can say the green one is taken out, but it is also possible that in this case I take the blue one out. Okay. And then over here, I can have the red one taken out. Oops red, and or the blue one taken out, and then in the last one here, um, nope, that's not what I want to do, I, had, I can have the red or the green one. Is that okay? Are they still understanding the, so this is usually better represented as a tree, okay? And this is also the reason why CISP430 is a co-requisite of this class. Because understanding a tree is, I mean, this is literally a tree, except it doesn't look like one, okay? Because I cannot easily make you know, branches and stuff like that. I suppose I can use, oh, okay, I can actually do that. Hmm. I'm thinking about using um, mermaid to actually draw a tree. Okay, so let me, let me give it a try. Okay, I've never tried it here with this tool. Yep, there is a markup language called mermaid. Mermaid. And I think it will work, you know, just, I need to give it a try first. Okay, let me to scroll this up. Okay, so I need to specify what kind of a graph it is. So in this case, I think it's just graph or flowchart. And I want to draw it from left to right. Just have to specify um, RGB go to I select a red one and then we have green and blue left. Nope, doesn't like it. Something else. I do flow. Nope. Hmm. All right. Let me just do a quick search on the syntax of mermaid. Mermaid syntax. And we are looking at a flowchart. chart LR and then we can specify the actual node. Flow chart LR. Let's 
just find something simple first. Okay, that's okay. So RDB. Choose R. Double check on the syntax one little thing at a time. So without a label, that's just a two dash and a greater than, but I can also label. Well, this is a tool that you can use for your other classes too, as you can see. But all I really want to do right now is to say, you know, how do I draw an arrow? There we go. So it is two dash and then three dashes, and then no space in it. Like that one. So let's see if we can try. If it doesn't work, you know, I'm just not going to. Likes that, but as soon as I try to specify the label name, it doesn't like it. I think oh. you put the type operator. Hmm? I think if you put the type operator instead, it picks up the dash. The type operator, oh. like this. Yeah. The or oh, the other reason why you know, this is a little bit. So type this using. <coughs> G, this is using the G. Using the G. Nope. Three dashes. Okay, so we'll try that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we Okay, but I want, I, I actually want the dash. I want the, the greater than. Okay. So if we choose the R, then we have G and B left. And then if we choose the R, G, and B, then we have uh, red and green left. R. All right. Well, I mean, it's OK. I really want to have that arrowhead, but if I cannot have the arrowhead, it's not the end of the world. There's a, there's a space called eraser for that. Uh -huh. You can use that. Oh, eraser. You just have to put it in line and then that's it. Okay. Well, since I'm already here, might as well just finish this one. So now we can specify what about RG. If out of RG, if you choose a R, then you have a G left. And then uh, with the, oh, I think, yep, that is correct. RB, if you choose the red, then you have the blue left. Out of RB, if you choose a B first, then you have the R left. And then out of this one, okay. so RG, if you choose the G first, then you have the R left. Yep, I mean, it does work that way. It's just that it doesn't look like a tree anymore. Um, to make it look like a tree, I have to make these names unique. Um, let me see. I think, do you guys generally get the idea of what I've tried to draw? Okay. Okay. So I can let you guys you know, finish drawing this tree. But you know, the original representation, you know, which is using just the text to represent it, works out too. So whenever you need to kind of think about you know, how why is it like this? You know, why do we count in a certain way? Having a graphical representation helps. Okay. So, getting back to the notes here, not this one, but here. So we are only making basically a Cartesian product. This big pi symbol is basically the product. But in this case, you know, this is the product of the this is the product of the cardinality of each T of something. Because if we want to count how many elements are in the big omega, 
this is how we can come up with the number. Is that okay? Because in, even in the example where we are picking a marble out of the whole thing, when you look at the cardinality of this T1, this T1, and this T1, even though the content are different, they still have the same cardinality. So that's why you know if you if all you if all you care is the cardinality of big omega, it is okay to do it this way. You just have a multiplication of the cardinality of each of the outcome set of a trial. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay. So that means you know, in the special case where t0, t1, all the way up to t subscript m minus 1, because there are m trials, if they're all the same, then it is easy to come up with the cardinality of the omega, because it is just n to the power of m, where n is the cardinality of each trial outcome set. Is that okay? Example, okay? Flipping a coin, okay? In the case of flipping a coin, each trial only has two possible outcomes. So let's just say that we're trying to throw you know, a coin or actually flip a coin three times. So what is the total number of possible outcomes for the entire experiment? Which one is M and which one is N? We got two and three here. Two is the two is the N, which is the cardinality of each outcome set. And then M, which is the number of trial, is three. Two to the power of two to the power of three is eight. So is that consistent with the example that you saw earlier? Okay, so let's double check. Okay, you I know you guys are paying right, being paying attention already, but I'm just gonna go double check here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that method of doing the calculation is correct. Okay. So right now, we are talking about the outcome set where you know, um, ordering is important. Because if you think about this, um, if you look at these as sets instead of tuples, they are all the same set. In other words, if ordering is not important, there's only one single outcome in this case. And there are some cases where the ordering is not important, such as when you buy a lot of ticket. Okay, so if somebody were to ask you, oh, can you help me find your five numbers you know, for my next lotto ticket? Oh, by the way, I also want you to help me to find the Powerball number. I can tell that person, eh, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, but it, it makes no difference whether it's five, four, three, two, one, or one, two, three, four, five, because in the case of the lotto ticket, the only, the only thing that matters is, is this number one of the numbers that matches you know, a number that that is picked. Is that, is that okay? So ordering is not important in some cases. All right, so now we're gonna introduce, you know, let, me, let me go back to the notes here first. So the concept of without replacement basically is the same thing as you're picking something out of a, out of a bag. Because whatever you choose out of the bag in a trial is not put back in the bag in the same experiment. Is that okay? So every time you choose something, you're gonna have to take that something out of the bag. So we're gonna take a look at the description here. A common restriction to trials in one experiment is whatever is chosen earlier cannot be a choice in later trials, such as you know, removing an item from a bag. Let us assume that we, said with it, we start with a set T when N equals to the cardinality of T as the set of outcomes of the very first trial of an experiment with M trials. So now we have two numbers, and the two numbers are not, ex well, I mean, they still mean the same thing, okay? N is still the cardinality of the trial outcome set, but only for the first trial, because every time we perform the next trial, we have one fewer item. And then M is still representing the number of trials. How many, how many times are we doing this? If E0, is, which is an element of T, is the actual outcome of trial zero, then E0 is no longer available for trial one. So trial one, as a set, only has an outcome set of T minus the set that contains E0. Does that make sense? So this is going back to set notation. The subtraction symbol only applies between two sets. And that's why I cannot say T minus E0. 
I have to t, I have to say t minus in curly braces d zero. Is that okay? Does everybody understand why we have the curly braces? Okay. All right. And as a result, you know, trial one will have n minus one items, you know, as the possible outcome set. Is that okay? Which is kind of what I said a little bit earlier with the RGB models in the baggie. And using E of I to represent the actual outcome of trial I in a particular experiment. So this is only specific to an experiment. It is easy to see that for trial I, the outcome set is going to be T minus. This is a big union, which means you know, I'm generating these terms, each one being a set and I'm doing a big union of all of these terms, and that entire union is subtracted from T. Is that okay? Does everybody still understand what this is representing? Good, okay, all right. So as a result, the number of choices is going to be T minus that whole thing. You know, the only difference between these two expressions is this one does not have the bar bar you know, surrounding it. This one does have the bar bar surrounding it which means one is referring to the actual set. The other one is referring only to the cardinality. Okay? So for counting purposes, an experiment of M trials, you know, and using this rule, which means you know, whatever you take out cannot be put back into the, into the bag, it's going to look like this. Um, you know, big, we have zero to M minus one as the designator of each trial. And then for each trial, it has n minus i items. So when you uh, look at this multiplication, you can, um, okay, so let's, let's do this step by step. This is regular algebra. This is not Boolean algebra. You can, uh, what is the change from the left-hand side to the right-hand side? Multiplication by one. Multiplication by one, like this is one, okay. So what exactly is this one? This is i going from m to n minus 1. This is i going from m to n minus 1. So the interesting thing is you know, after I multiply this side to this side, I now have this and this. Now the denominator does not need to be explained because it's the same. What about the numerator? How come the numerator, instead of having two you know, big multiply, it is now one single big multiply? What is going on here? Okay, look at the indexes. In other words, for each pi operator, for each of your product, this one starts from zero, it ends at one m minus one, okay? This one starts at m, and it ends at n minus one. So that means between this pi and this pi here, they can be combined into one bigger pi, where we're just starting from zero and ending all the way at n minus one. N has to be greater than or equal to M. Is that okay? All right. So now when we look at this division here, um, so when going from here to here, we are, let's see, oh, okay. So instead of using you know, um, i to n minus one and the expression is n minus i, I'm flipping around so that the expression that is being multiplied is just i, but I, at the same time I have to change the index to go from one to n in this case and change it to one to n minus one in this case. Okay, so let's think about you know, the terminal conditions, okay, which means you know, the first and the last item in the multiplication. Let's think about this one. When uh, when i equals to n minus one, which is you know i being the largest it can, what am I actually multiplying here? What is the term here when i equals to n minus one? Substitute do a substitute of i being n minus one and put it here. What do I get? I get one. Okay. So what about the other end? What happens when i equals to m over here? In that case, there's not much I can say other than it just becomes n minus m. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, that's exactly what I have here. 
because I'm only focusing on each term that I'm multiplying, and I'm saying, oh, okay, this thing here is the same thing as this thing over here, because I figured that you know, the, all the numbers that the numbers that I'm multiplying is from one to n minus m. Oh, this is specifying exactly the same thing. Is that okay? And I did the same trick with the numerator. So the numerator, you know, I use the same trick, which means you know what happens when i equals to zero? This whole thing just becomes n. So I got an n covered here. What happens when i equals to n minus one? Mm, same thing. N minus n minus one in parentheses is just one. I got that covered here as well. But instead of having n minus i as the term being multiplied, I simplified to only have i being is that okay? All right. So that is interesting because you know, when we look at this term here, this means you know, we have one times two times three all the way up to n, otherwise known as n factorial. Over here, we have one times two times three all the way up to n minus m as a, as a single term. So we have n minus m the entire thing factorial. So this thing is also counting the number of permutations when we're choosing items out of a certain set. So that's why it has a big P here. And N is the number of items that we start off with. M is the number of trials, which means how many times am I removing something from the bag. So first of all, there are a few things that are important here. This is the original form, okay, you know, because you know, we are just looking at you know, a bag originally having six items. So let's just say that out of the six items, I only want to choose three out of the bag, okay? But this time, I have a little tube, okay, to fit you know, the, a marble. So now, I, you know, once, every time I remove a marble, I put it into a tube. Every time I remove a marble, I put it into a tube. So being a tube that has the same diameter as a marble, the ordering matters, right? Because you know, depending on how I remove the marbles from the bag, they look different when you look at the sequence. Is that okay? So removing a red marble first and then a blue marble would look different in the tube as opposed to removing a blue marble first and then a red marble. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. So are there any questions about this number here? This is going to be the cardinality of Omega, when we start off with n items in a bag, and I need to remove m of those, then the ordering of the removal is important. Is that okay so far? Okay. Let's try out an experiment. Okay, let's try out here one example. So I'm not going to use the tree representation. I will just go ahead and use the usual uh, text representation in this case. So this time I'll make it not too fancy. Um, I will basically just you know, say that T0, which is you know, the original item, I just have you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay. And I, okay, that's too much. Let's limit to four items. So I want to say that, so in this case, N is 4 because n is referring to the number of items that we start off with. So let's just say that I want to uh, say m equals to two, which means I'm only removing two out of the four items. And I want to find out how many ways can I remove two items out of four without replacement, but ordering is important. Are we good so far? So now I can go ahead and enumerate. Okay, I'm going to erase this you know, because every time I add something, you know, it points you know, the screen. So that's kind of distracting. There we go. Okay. So now I want to look at omega. And this is without using a very systematic way. And this time I do need to use uh, parentheses. Okay. So one can be followed by two, one can be followed by three. One can be followed by four. Okay, those are three possible outcomes, but we are not done yet. Okay, because you know, two can start first, then followed by one. Two can start first, then followed by three. Two can start first, then followed by four. Okay, 
and then three can start first, followed by one, three can start first, followed by two, and then three can start first, followed by four. Is that okay? And then four can start first, followed by one, four followed by two, four followed by three, and that's it. Um, so I need to make it a little wider to fit the entire thing. I cannot change the divider, unfortunately. If I could, you know, I would put more space to the right hand side. So how many elements do we have in this spectrum right now? There are 12 of them, okay? Does it match the equation? In other words, if I were to plug in the N and the M here back to the equation that I had earlier, let me switch back to the earlier part, which is here. N is four, right? What is four factorial? 24, and then four minus two, because M is two, because we are only performing two steps of the, in the experiment. Four minus two is two. Two factorial is two. What is 24 divided by two? 12. Is that okay? So I just want to double check. I just want to use an example to give you an example, you know, to, of, you know, when n equals to four, m equals to two, this is your original set. Ah, okay. The, the math, does, they do work out. Is that okay so far? All right. <clears throat> so switching back to the notes here. So the next, you know, um, section is titled ordering, which is basically saying, but in some cases, we don't really care about the ordering. So how do we handle those cases? Well, in, that, in those cases, then all you have to do is to say, oh, of the outcome where ordering is important, a bunch of those outcomes really map to one single outcome when ordering is not important, okay? So we're gonna use the example that we were working on here, okay? And I'm gonna document here, if ordering is important, then we have something like this. So the question is, what if ordering is not important? So I'm gonna use is not important. Well, if ordering is not important, then one, two, and two, one should become one single out. Okay? So now, okay, so this is this is interesting, okay, because the way I edit this is kind of you know, important because that's how you know, we can look at this whole thing. So instead of having a tuple of one, two, I now have a set of one, two, which means your two, one, which is also considered to be a set in this context, really does not exist because you cannot have duplicate elements in a set. Is that okay? So one, two, two, one becomes one, and then I can do exactly the same thing with one, three, turn that into a set, and then three, one, should not be a duplicate item anymore. So you can probably see you know, how you know, where this is going. So one four, oops, the other one, and four one are basically the same. And then two three, I mean, you, this part should be really boring to you because you you already know what I need to do. So two four and four two are the same. And then finally three, four, and four, three are the same. Okay. So let's take a look at that. All right. So I'll be doing okay so far with this transition. If we want to count number of tuples, which means the ordering is important, we have twice as many items. But if ordering is not important, then two of the original items are really the same thing. So, hmm, but what is the pattern here, right? The pattern is, yes? So then the ordering is important, we have two poles, but when it's not important, we have sets? Yes. Because if all you care is whether one is chosen or not, but not in which trial, then the number of possible outcomes is only half of what it used to be. 
But the question is, why is it only half? Well, okay, it's pretty obvious here, right? Because 1, 2, and 2, 1 are the same, and the 1, 3, and 3, 1 are the same, and so on. Okay. Hmm. So why do why are there two, you know, if if the set in concern is one two, why are there two tuples corresponding to that set? Okay, so hmm? well, so this time you know, you can you can think of it like this. Okay, I only have two models in my heart. Red and blue. And I, my question is, out of those two marbles, how many ways can I take the marbles out when ordering is important? They go like, oh, that's easy. The first marble that's, that I'm taking out of my pocket can be either red or blue. The second one has to be whatever is remaining. Is that okay? But Tag, is, isn't this the same thing that we talked about earlier? It is. Okay. So that means, you know, if we want to reduce the number of, if we want to count the number of duplicate tuples that correspond to the same set, if the number of tuples corresponding to a set is the cardinality of the set factorial. Okay, let me say that one more time. <laughs> if I give you a set, okay, so if I, okay, let me scroll here. If I give you a set, okay, so this time I'll make it a little bit more complicated. One, two, three, four. <clears throat> um, how many tuples have exactly the same four elements? That is the question that we were trying to answer. So what about this one? Okay, this specific question. I have four items in a set. One, two, three, four. And I want you to answer the question of how many four tuples can I make that contains exactly the same four elements? They go like, okay, one, two, three, four is one. One, two, four, three is another one. One, three, four, three is another one, and so on. So how many? Hmm? Nope, not 16. Think about it from the other perspective. So this time I have four marbles in a pot, labeled one, two, three, four. So the first time I draw a marble out, how many choices do I have? All four choices, right? Yeah, because all four marbles are still in a pot. Okay, I take the marble out, put it down, okay? But it technically is a tuple, right? So if I take another marble out of my pocket, this time is the second time, the second time I draw a marble out of my pocket, how many outcomes do I have in this case? Three, okay, and then two, and then one. So it becomes four times three times two times one, otherwise known as four factorial, which is 24. Is that okay? So that's why, you know, when you want to count the number of ways that a set can have tuples, it is just the factorial of the cardinality of the set. Okay, let me, let me write it down and then you guys can tell me whether you're getting this or not. The number of ways to make tuples out of a set, and let's give it a name, you know, S, is the cardinality, the cardinality of S factorial. Okay, so I'm just gonna pause here to see if we understand this statement. If I give you a set, F, Okay, which has you know, a certain number of elements in it. And what I want to tell you, how many tuples can I make out of you know, elements of this set? It will be the cardinality of S factorial. So this exclamation point is not a punctuation in an English sentence, it is actually just factorial. Does that make sense to you? Okay, I see some nods and I see some hesitation. Oh, no, 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 it has nothing to do with power, okay? Power only works when you're not 
when it is with replacement. So every time I draw a marble out of my pocket, I put it back in the bag, then it is a power. But if I take something out and I put, I don't, I do not put it back in the bag, then it is not a power anymore. Right, but you sum it by the power of the next amount of uh, the recovery of budget. So it is okay. So don't think about power because every time you multiply the next experiment, the total number of outcomes is reduced by one. Right. If you put it by the power of n minus one, it is not it power. It is not power. Do not think of power. Because when we think about power, you are multiplying the same number multiple times. But in this case, we are not multiplying the same number multiple times. Because every single number in the long product is 4, 3, 2, 1. It is not replicating. It's not duplicating in the entire product through the multiplication. So it is not power. Okay, this is factorial. It's important to make that distinction, okay? It, it, might, it might sound like I'm just nitpicking on the word, but I'm not, okay? Because when we say power, we are usually implying that we have one number that is multiplying to itself a certain number of times. But that's not what we are doing here. Is that okay so far? All right. Okay. So, hmm, so let's think about this for a little bit, okay? So in the case of the lotto, okay, in Powerball lotto, okay, if we not considering the Powerball number, okay, the number of permutations is this notation, you know, we have a P, and then the superscript is going to be 69 because there are 69 numbers of which we are choosing five of those. Okay, so let me scroll up a little bit here. And that is simply a notation. What it does translate to is simply it is the fraction of 69 factorial divided by uh, 69 minus five factorial. Is that okay? So let's, let's just pause here for a moment, okay? If you think about the Powerball motto, you know, um, rules, you have 69 numbers of which we're gonna choose five. That's gonna be the winning thing. We are ignoring the Powerball number completely. Is that okay? So what I'm asking here is what are, how many ways can we choose five out of 69 numbers? But in this case, because this is counting permutations, so that means the ticket with one, two, three, four, five in it, and the ticket with five, four, three, two, one, are considered different, okay? This, this, is, this is counting one, two, three, four, five as one, five, four, three, two, one as one, one, two, three, five, four as yet another one, Two, one, three, four, five, as yet another one. Okay, so now the question is, um, but that's not how the game is played because if the game you know, does not count those as duplicates, as long as one is in the ticket, it's fine. Okay, I don't really care where it is. So how do I know the total number of possible tickets where I take into consideration of all of these duplicates? Yes. Divided by five factorial in this case. Okay, so now we I can now say the total number of combinations. Okay, and I'll explain the term combinations is going to be the fraction. By the way, these are all in your notes too, so I'm just, you know, may not be exactly the same way. So the first part is 69 factorial divided by 69 minus five, the whole thing factorial. And then the second one is just five factorial. And it might need to be, I might need to zoom in a little bit here. 
okay? Because the, the font does get smaller when I have fraction of a fraction. There we go. Okay. So right now I'm focusing on this thing here. It's like, what the heck is that? Well, 69 factorial divided by 69 minus 5 to a factorial, that's the number of combinations where I'm only counting with the number of ways to choose five numbers out of 69, but ordering is important. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one, count as two elements in that particular set. Okay, then you go like, but tech, no, 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 no. This is not how Lotto is playing, okay? You know, because you know, as long as one, two, three, four, and five are on the ticket, it's considered as one ticket, okay? Then go like, okay, fine, okay, but how many ways, how many duplicates do I have just for one, two, three, four, five in a set? They go like, well, you got five different things and we are taking one thing out at a time until there's nothing left. So there are five factorial ways, there are five factorial duplicates for each ticket when I want to look at you know, things that are, where the ordering is important. Is that okay? Does everybody understand why the division by five factorial will take care of the duplicates? One, two, three, four, five as a set has five factorial or 120 permutations corresponding to it. Is that okay? Yes. So out of 69 items, mm -hmm. you only take five items, right? Yes. And just to add one more notation here, there's a shorthand for this because we are counting the number of combinations. So the way it is denoted in this case is just you know, kind of the same as a P notation, except we use C for combination instead of P for permutation. Are we good so far? Yep, go ahead. Oh, I need an equal sign here. There's one more notation for this one, okay? You know, the other notation for this one is to use the choose. So I think I have to remember how to use this choose thing. So uh, I think for choose, I need two numbers, N and M. Nope, that's not how it works. Oh, I know what. I think this has to be uh, M, N, choose, M, I have to put the whole thing in braces too. There we go. Yeah. So this notation, which looks kind of funny, is the same thing as you know, the number of combinations. When you start off with n items, then you choose m of those. Are we okay so far with this? All right. So I think we have enough vocabulary to talk about the birth date problem. Okay, it's not really a problem. It is just a you know, calculation that surprises most people. So let me just do a quick head count here. We got seven, 11, 15, 21, 25, 27. So there are 27 people in this classroom, including myself, 28. So the question is, what are the chances that out of 28 people in the room that nobody shares the same birth date? You can also flip it around and ask, how, what are the chances that at least two people in this room share the same birth date? Okay, so year is not a part of it. Okay, we're only looking into the month and the day of month of the birth date. Is that okay? So, okay, so which way do you want to look at it? Because they're equivalent. Do, do you want to look at it as no two people in this class share the same birth date? Or do you want to look at it as at least two people in this classroom share the same birth date? At least two? Okay, we can do it that way. Okay, so now the question, if I were to write it here, is what are the chances that of 28 people, at least two 
share the same birth date, not including the year. Okay. All right. So how do we attack this problem? We're looking at probability here. Okay. So that means, hmm, I need to take a look at the total number of ways for people to have birth dates in you know, of 28 people. Okay, so let's take a look at omega here. But before we do that, let's think about what a trial looks like. Okay, so a trial is um, one person's birth date. Okay, so this is not an action because you don't get to choose which day you were born on. Okay, but nonetheless, we are still only we are only interested in the possibility. So if um, each trial is looking at one person's birth date, what is the total number of outcomes per person in this class? Well, it doesn't matter whether it's this class or not, as long as that person is on Earth or anything on Earth, because you know, it takes 365 and some re self revolution of the Earth to go through you know, the entire you know, track around the, around the sun. So how many choices do we have? 365, okay? So, okay, so we'll, we'll write it down here. Okay, we'll say the cardinality of T is 365. There are 365 possible outcomes for each trial, which is each person's you know, possible range of birth dates. It could be one in two, 365. 365 days. Is that okay? All right. And there are 28 people, right? So then omega, or the cardinality of omega, is going to be what? We know it is n to the power of m, okay, from earlier. What is n this time? n is the same as this. What is m? Do you remember what m represents? The total number of trials, right? And we got 28 people, so there are 28 trials. So in this case, it is basically 365 to the power of the number of people in the class, which is 28. And you look at this and go like, okay, so that includes the really, really rare chance that everybody is born on the first day of the year. It also includes the really, really rare chance that everybody is born on the second day of the year, and so on. Okay, because it includes every single possible way each person's your birth date is independent to the next person's. Is that okay? So this is a rather huge number. This will give us, you know, the cardinality of omega. So now we want to say, okay, so we, we now I now introduce another term. It's, it's, it's called um, event, okay? So an event is a set of elements, okay, I can say it's a subset of big omega that contains elements that we are interested in. So that means there's no particular way to uh, generally describe what is the event set. We only know that the event set is a subset of big omega. So we look at all the possible outcomes of the entire experiment, and we go like, but we are concerned, we, are, we, we want to count these ones, okay? So if my interest is to find out um, what are the chances that no one shared the same birth date, because that is the opposite, is the complement of what we are actually interested in. Let me say that one more time. We are interested in counting the number of ways where at least two people share the same birth date. Okay? That problem can be very difficult to express because what if these two people share the same birth date, those people, the three people will share a different birth date. We have to take all of those into consideration and it's a huge mess to try to express that in a closed form. But if you add up all of those cases, okay, it really is the same thing as the complement, which is the opposite of everybody has a different birth date in this entire class. 
Does that make sense to you? Okay, let me say that out in English and you can tell me whether that makes sense or not. If we, if all the cases where everybody in this class have unique birth date, if I count all of those cases out, what is left are the cases where at least two people in this class share the same birth date. Does that make sense to you? Because all I'm saying is birth dates are no longer unique in this classroom. Is that okay? It is being having the same birth date that is, or having not the same birth date that is, that is of concern to me. Okay, so in this particular case, we'll define the event. Okay, event E to contain only elements of big omega, where everyone has a unique birth date. Is that okay? That's just how I'm defining E, E of uppercase E as a set. It is a subset of big omega, and each element of E is representing a way to distribute birth dates where no one, no, no two people in this class share the same birth date. All birth dates are unique. Is that okay? <coughs> so now the question is, how do we calculate that? How many ways can we arrange birth dates in this class of 28 people so that no two people share the same birth date? Well, we can look at it this way. We can say, okay, you choose a birth date, okay? Whatever you choose, you cannot choose that anymore, okay? And if whatever you two have chosen, you cannot choose any one of those two dates. So is that okay? So that would give us how many? What is the total number? First of all, we know this is without replacement because whatever the first person has chosen, the second person cannot choose anymore. Whatever the first two people have chosen, the third person cannot choose anymore. So this is without replacement. So once you know it is without replacement, you only got two options. You're either looking at combination where um, um, ordering is not important or you're looking at permutations where ordering is important. So now the big question is, does it, does it count as two cases if you choose the first day of the year and you choose the second day of the year, as opposed to you choose the second day of the year and you choose the first day of the year? Does it, does it make a difference? Uh, can they be counted as two separate elements? That really is the question. What do you think? So to answer that question, you have to look at big omega. Because we are looking at the number of elements in the event set as opposed to as a ratio of the number of elements in big omega. So you have to be comparing apples to apples, oranges to oranges. So when you look at this big omega, does this ordering important? It is 365 to the power of 28, which means it does count the case where you choose the first day of the year, you choose the second day of the year, that is in one entire you know, big you know, subset. But when you choose the second day and you choose the first day, that is considered different. They are considered unique. So if you need to compare apples to apples, so that means if big omega consists of a whole bunch, like a, a lot of tuples, then E should also be including tuples and not sets. So that means ordering is important. Okay, we're counting permutations. So now the question is, how many permutations do I get when each person, uh, when there are 365 days to begin with, and each person has to choose a unique date, and ordering is important, there are 28 people. <laughs> okay, but what about in terms of the symbols that we have used? I just not want to know, you know, in terms of the cardinality of E, 
how do I express here? Okay, first of all, do I use P or do I use C? P, that's right. And what is the total number of things to choose from to begin with? 365, and how many times are we choosing? 28, yep. So we are looking at permutation, but we know what this expands to. If I need to do a calculation, I know how to you know, work this out, okay? It's because you know, that was discussed a little bit earlier. So this is by itself a fraction where the top, the numerator is 365 factorial, and the bottom part, I mean, you, if you want to kind of save you some time, you can say, okay, what is 365 minus 28, and then just use that number and then say the factorial. But since my arithmetic is not really that good, I'm just gonna use the expression here. Okay. So now, I'm not working out the numbers yet because a spreadsheet or a calculator is much better than I am working out numbers like what is 365 to the power of 28. That's a huge number. So now we've got these two numbers, okay? The probability of this happening, okay? The probability, probability is going to be, is a fraction again, okay? So depending on what we're interested in, but for the time being, we're gonna, we're gonna stick with everybody has a unique birth date. So this becomes the answer. The probability that everybody has a unique birth date, okay, I need to close the bar and not a curly raise. There we go, there we go, okay. So in this case, if I want to calculate the, the probability that everybody has a unique birth date, then it is the cardinal of E, which is this number here, which is also expanded to this number, divided by the cardinal of omega, which is found out a little bit earlier, which is 365 to the power of 28. So without doing the actual calculation, pick a you know, approximate number here. Okay, this has to be a number from zero to one, right? Because it's a probability. So pick a number, okay? Most people would say, well, the more people in the class, then the, the, the less likely that we will have unique birthdays, right? Okay, so you, you kind of expect you know, you know, the number to go down as we have more people in the class. So we'll do some calculation, and to do this part, I am going to use a spreadsheet. I'm going to abuse this spreadsheet, which is already used for some other purpose, but you know, just so that we can take a look. All right, so we are looking at the division between uh, permut, okay? This is permutation, okay? In the spreadsheet, the number of permutation is permut. You start off with 365, we choose 28. And we are dividing this by the power of 365 to the power of 28. That turns out to be uh, 30, eh, approximately 34, 35% chance. That is unique. So that means it leaves 65% of a chance that at least two people in this class share the same birth date. Does that surprise you? The chances are higher than mo what most people would think. Because most people would think the more people in the class, the more likely that two people would share, at least two people share the same birth date. That's, that's just you know, kind of intuitive. But how quickly that number increases surprises most people. So if you were to change the math, okay, so I can actually you know, use an equation here. So instead of using this, we can say, um, Number of people in the class, okay? This is now the number of people in the class. So what happens when we have 29 people, okay? 29, okay, this is actually a this equation here. And then over here, I just use a um, formula so that I don't have to come up with the same number. So 365, choose whatever this number is, divided by the power of 365 raised to this as an, as an exponent. So we'll go ahead and do this. And then we'll just extend it down a little bit, you know, maybe just to the end of this screen here. So when we have 47 people in the class, the chances of everybody has a unique birth date 
is going down to 4.5%. You go like, but there are 365 days in a year when you have 47 people in a class, the chances of everybody having a unique birth date is down to 4.5%. So this number does not change, you know, it is not intuitive, okay? So just one more thing before we get out of this class, because you know, I do want to get back to the original question, which is what are the chances that at least two people in the class have the same birth date? And that's just your one minus whatever this number is, because this number is the, the part that we want to exclude, okay? So now we just look at this, double click it. So that tells you, you know, the chances. And you can see, you know, it, is, it doesn't make sense, okay? Well, quote, unquote, it doesn't make sense. Because 47 is less than one seventh of all the number of, day, of the number of days in a year. And yet, the chances of two people have, at least two people having the same birth date is all the way up to 95%. It's almost a certainty. And that's not even 50 yet. So, are we okay with this calculation? Okay. I am going to move my notes you know, from where it is to GitHub, but I'm also going to add some more explanation, okay? And that has to do with when do we choose to use permutation and when do we choose to use combination? Because I think that's one of the biggest questions is, which one should we use? We know we have to use one of them because it is without replacement but which one should be used? So I've got to add some more notes to that. All right, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Don't forget about your homework assignment that is due on Wednesday. You mean the job plan? Are you sure you want it? Because it looks kind of messy to me. Okay, all right, I'll, I'll put it up. Yeah, dropping this kind of nice because we actually save the content like right away. So even if I don't do anything and like shut down the computer, it's still going to be safe. Yeah, so just remind me if you don't see it in the announcement, remind me sometime today. Yeah.